On this episode of How They Operate Remotely, we're going to chat with Bart, a friend of mine from the Netherlands, who recently ran an Australian edition of a conference where he live streamed from his office a bunch of talks and also some live segments. So we're going to chat about the gear he used and how he made it all happen. So thanks for uh, joining me, Bart. Yeah, great. It's uh, good to see you again. I mean, from a screen, but uh, it's been a while, but uh, likewise. Exactly. We used to do a lot of uh, streams together over the last few years, but we haven't really done much in the last year or so. Uh, yeah, it's almost a year ago. Like the video you did recently from the, the comparison, like last year and the year before, that I think that was the last time we did uh, a gig together. So in this video, we're going to kind of talk about the gear you used um, now that things are completely different and you have to do things remotely. So the stream itself was a mixture of mostly playouts, but also some live stuff. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Um, the first two editions, we didn't do anything live. It was all pre-recorded. Uh, this time we did some live introductions and um, closing thoughts at the end of the conference. Uh, personally, I think it is a good touch to have live um, to have live parts in a conference. Uh, for a keynote, it's not that important to do it live. There's I think too much that can go wrong. And to be honest, our first live part went horribly wrong. Um, we had a, I had a big freeze on my machine. So um, yeah, I just had to reboot. <laughs> and then after that, it went fine. But these things always happen uh, with, uh, with life. And you did send me some footage of behind the scenes look of that gear. And um, I think we could take a look at that now, actually. So what am I seeing here on all these screens? What's happening? On the far left, you see basically that's the platform where the conference was um, uh, was being streamed to, uh, and yeah, what was taking place at. Uh, that was Hopin. I have that on screen so that I can see if the live stream that we are uh, sending out is actually showing up on the virtual stage. Then in the middle, uh, on the top, you see uh, the multi view from uh, my ATAM. The big screen on the right is basically, um, yeah, uh, the main control screen with a Slack channel. ATAM control, obviously, and then below that is uh, Wirecast. In this occasion, it's only uh, I'm only using it for titles and graphics. To the left of it, you see my Atomus recorder and that I was using that this time for play out. Um, and all that was mixed and live streamed uh, through the ATEM Mini Pro, Pro ISO actually. The Pro ISO was doing the streaming, but you also had a secondary device, uh, which was a Magewell device as a backup streamer. How would you have went from one to the other if one of them went down? I could have used the program out of the ATEM into the uh, Matewell device. Um, if that would have failed, uh, if the ATEM by itself would have failed, then I still have the ATEM Television Studio HD um, and I would have swapped them. It should have been a couple of minutes, uh, but yeah, that um, I, I would have done it that way. A huge chunk of the actual broadcast was playing back videos and what really caught my eye was the way that you um, the way that you could sort of dander from your computer and know that a video was going to end soon and uh, could you talk me through that a little bit yeah there was something i just realized uh, uh, beforehand that this time i was playing out through the atomus uh, recorder it shows how much time's already elapsed not how much still remaining so i needed a way <laughs> to see that on screen and because I was not using HDR graphics, I realized, wait a minute, that piece of software has a timer in it and I can control it through uh, the streaming deck. So I, I sort of put together a couple of commands, um, including um, setting a timer and starting a timer in uh, HDR graphics. And then also uh, starting an internal timer in, um, uh, in the companion app and that after that timer, it sends uh, an HTTP request to Zapier, which then sends uh, uh, a push notification via pushover to my mobile phone. <laughs> so the conference organizers, they already get used to it that uh, 10 minutes before uh, a keynote is over, and I think two minutes before the keynote is over, I send them uh, a warning through the Slack channel. Um, but I was like, yeah, if I don't know when 10 minute, the T minus 10 minute moment is, then how am I going to send them that message? So yeah, I kind of hacked this together. <laughs> it worked surprisingly well, actually. 
the conference itself was in a completely different time zone. So I guess you had to kind of do some out of office hours uh, scheduling. Is that right? Yeah, you can say that again because I'm based in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. Uh, the conference was taking place in uh, Australian time zone. Um, so yeah, that was a, a 10 hour time difference. And I think they started quite late in the morning. Before the conference, I slowly shifted my day-night rhythm, uh, going to, to sleep every night a couple of hours later and then waking up, uh, well, at least trying to wake up a couple of hours later. Um, so it was difficult, but in the end, it worked pretty well, uh, actually, yeah. Thanks so much for taking us through all the equipment and the, and the stuff you used for this one. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you're welcome, John. It was, uh, it was really nice to talk to you. And uh, yeah, let's hope we can uh, one day meet again. I do hope you find that useful. And if you want more videos like this, let me know in the comments below. And if anything wasn't clear, then let me know down there as well. Thanks for watching.